Did you know that in Southeast Asia and some parts of Africa, motorbike taxis as shown here in figure five are a thing? That's literally when a motorbike rolls up, you hop on the back and then ride to wherever you want to go. That's all well and good, except during COVID and even now, people are concerned about catching something from the driver while riding one. And it makes sense. I mean, sure, you just get to jump onto the back of a stranger's motorbike and hug the person, but who knows what they have. They could have even the heebie-jeebies and when they cough, you might get them too. So how likely are you to be exposed to their breath and the mucus that it carries? That is what we're looking at today. And to find that answer, we are looking at this paper called Exposure Risk Analysis of COVID-19 for a Ride-Sharing Motorbike Taxi. It's open access and you can find it in the link below. And in this study, you'll see some pretty interesting findings, especially some gross ones, but you'll see. Anyway, so the researchers did CFD to track the particles they put in the system. And the particles simulate the driver coughing and the cozy geometry can be seen here in figure one, along with a real life example of one of these motorbike taxis. So I find these motorbike taxis truly fascinating because I've been to Southeast Asia multiple times and I've seen a lot of people riding motorbikes like this and even more. And it never occurred to me that these are taxis. I mean, from this real life image in figure one, how can you tell? Do you just start jumping onto the back of random people's motorbikes until one of them gives you a lift where you want to go? I don't know. Anyway, the CAD geometry is a little sparse with the front forks missing, the swing arm at the back missing, and pretty much the entire drivetrain and even the wheel spokes. But I don't think that is a major issue here because this paper focuses on the general effects. And what's more, that is really all we can really take the results as. Because if you get to specific results for two people, that means you need to have their exact body shapes, how they're exactly sitting on the motorbike, and even the type of clothing they're wearing. So we can really only look at the general aerodynamics of this setup. So this simplified model, I think, of this motorbike and the setup is fine, I think. Now, in addition to the investigation uh, of the aerodynamics for this typical setup, where you have just two people sitting snugly together, the researchers also wanted to see if you could prevent potentially any cough going on the passenger by putting some kind of barrier in between the two riders to prevent that from happening. So in figure two, we see this barrier and it's kind of like this huge spoon that goes between the two. And it goes right in front of the passenger's face and I hope that would be see-through, otherwise the passenger would just be staring at a blank wall the entire journey. <laughs> so that is the geometry. Let's go through their CFD setup. So they used URANs in open foam, which is a decent enough just to get a general investigation idea. And they used the CAMIG SST turbulence model, which I think is good. And actually, I would be quite interested to see in this particular case, how different turbulence models would work in their setup because effectively, we have just this big spoon barrier, which is such a bluff body. And I think almost any turbulence model would probably work. But anyway, they used open foam. And if you want to learn how to use open foam, which is a really good CFD software, but hard to learn, you can take our course uh, in the link below. But with the particles that they inject into the flow, they're simulating all these different particles coming out of the driver's mouth when they cough. And they simulated three different sized particles, one micron, 10 micron, and 50 microns. They say that they chose this range because not only do we have different sized particles coming out of us, but also because the small particles can stay in the air while for hours sometimes, while the larger ones act more apparently like ballistic projectiles. And in fact, this is actually a very good topic to know about because in PIV, for example, which is a very powerful experimental technique, the particle size hugely determines how well the f they will follow the flow. So one micron particles are good and can stay suspended in the air for hours even sometimes. But even at 10 microns already, the settling time is pretty fast, like within 20, min uh, 20 minutes, sorry, their particles will fall out of the air in a big wind tunnel. And because of their size, 10 microns, for example, they have a lot of inertia behind them. And that means they are far less likely to follow high vorticity flows. They'll just fall out of them and, and the, uh, the centripetal forces will throw them to the side. So they won't follow the flow faithfully, we call it. So the smaller particles are better in that case. Now, one thing that I'm very impressed with is how thorough these authors were when they were modeling the driver's mouth. They went as far as to say that they researched how big a mouth is during coughing and then sized the driver's mouth to be that size. And in table one, we see the properties of these particles simulated. And interestingly, the density of them is set to 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. So about water, I guess that's a good approximation. Um, and also this cough lasted 0.3 seconds. But in that time, 1,004 particles were expelled through 
to the driver's mouth. I'm not sure why they selected so many and I can't seem to find any reference to the number of particles a cough would excel in this paper. But anyway, uh, the particles were excelled at 10 meters per second during the cough. So that's really fast, that's 36 kilometers per hour. That's almost as fast as the motorbike. So something else that they cover well is that they say that the volume fraction of these particles is so low that there is no need to have a two-way coupling between the air and the particles. There is only a need for a one-way coupling from the air to the particles, which means that the air only affects the particles and the particles don't affect the air. So it's not this vice versa two-way street. They say that if they had to increase the particle size diameter to 100 microns, then the volume fraction of these particles would be then high enough to have a two-way coupling where the air would affect the particles, but in return, the particles would affect the air too. So I'd need to have that two-way coupling, but here, because they only used up to 50 microns, one way was enough. Now in figure three, we can see their CFD domain and it's really good. So they have a very big box to encompass the rider, both the riders, I guess. And the inlet is located about eight motorbikes upstream about, and the outlet is about 20 motorbike lengths downstream. And the sides are located very far away as is the top. So the domain size is really big and it's really good. Um, they did a good job here and it shouldn't affect the results at all. The walls were also, um, no slip condition, oh, sorry, uh, slip conditions, so no boundary layers would be forming there. And that is exactly what happens in real life, so that is good. Now, the researchers elevated the bike so that the tires didn't touch the ground. They say that there was a 50 millimeter gap between the bottom of the tire and the ground. Now, this is usually done to make the meshing easier because you don't have really small and potentially poor quality cells where the tire meets the road. And I think that is what they have done here for this reason but they don't seem to say exactly why. I think that's why. So they just say that this approach doesn't affect the results very much, um, which is arguable. Um, I mean, it depends on how accurate you want to make the simulation. For example, if you were doing racing motorbike CFD, where a percent or two is a big deal, then this wouldn't be good enough. But for this general CFD, then it's good enough. And well, so <laughs> they also say that the motorbike configuration without the shield, they needed 40 million cells. And with this shield, 45 million cells. So we can see in figure four, um, their mesh, and I am having a hard time believing that they use 40 million cells here. I mean, I, can, I can't see it that clearly, but um, I guess maybe they had a really fine mesh around the riders. Um, they say that they had an average U, uh, Y plus value of one, uh, around one, which means that they must have had some regions with a Y plus value above one. And that is also surprising to me because if there are some regions that don't have a Y plus value less than one, then 40 million cells is still a lot. So I'm not sure where they're spending them here. I, maybe their inflation layer growth rate is quite low and maybe their refined mesh is very fine as well. I can't really tell from figure four that well. And also maybe their mesh needed to be so fine around the riders to accurately simulate this particles moving around. I'm not too sure, but they say 45 million cells. So the researchers simulated this setup at one meter per second, five meters per second, and 15 meters per second. So one meter per second is just like crawling around pretty much. Uh, five meters per second is like going over a speed bump perhaps or in slow moving traffic. 15 meters per second would be typically cruising around the city, particularly in a lot of Southeast Asian countries where th there's a lot of traffic and you know things just move um, like with a steady pace as opposed to just um, traffic jams a lot of the time. So anyway, for their validation, um, it's quite interesting. They didn't have any data for this particular setup, but in figure 10 in the appendix, Let's go down there so I can show you. They did have a validation study of their CFD method with a different setup. So this was a cyclist trailing behind a motorbike. They simulated this entire thing in CFD to try to prove that their CFD method was good. So they compared their CFD results with the CFD results that have been published in another paper, plus experimental results as well. And they get really good results. They were within about 10% of the drag found across the board, the different um, distances of the cyclists downstream. Um, so they definitely tried to validate their CFD results. It's just that they were strapped for validation data for their specific case. As such, I think their general results are fine, but any quantitative data should be taken with a little caution. And for their mesh independence test, uh, we can see the results in figure f in table four, sorry. So they are again for this cyclist following the motorbike setup. And they looked at six different meshes, which I feel really bad for them because it means that to begin with, they were super optimistic. And then they had to constantly refine their mesh more and more, <laughs> run it more and more times before they finally got to the independent mesh. 
So the logic behind this measure independence approach and this validation approach is that they, again, are just trying to get a geometric setup that is close to their actual setup and hope that they can validate their CFD approach and then transport that approach over to their geometry. And this is really the best that they can do, so hats off to them. And indeed, for this mesh independent study, they did arrive at a mesh independent, uh, independent mesh. And one thing that needs to be factored in is though that they're using URANs. And we all know that URANs is not good at picking up the finer flow features. And in this case, the finer flow features can make a big difference to where the particles go. So that is something to keep in mind. So overall, based on their efforts for the validation and mesh dependent study, um, the CFD might be around 7.5 out of 10, or maybe 10, oh, sorry, 7.5 or 8 out of 10. I mean, it's good enough for this uh, study, but I think um, the numbers, as we'll see later on, might be a little bit off because of the minor differences in the flow features because of the URANs approach. Now let's get to the results. So in figure five, if I scroll all the way back up there now, we see the flows in a plane cutting through the motorbike and the rider. And I'll zoom in a little bit here as well. Let's see, okay, that's a bit better. Um, in the right column, it is for the motorbike with the big spoon shield you can see just in here. And we can see that the results are from one meter per second up to 15 meters per second. And in the leftmost column is without the big spoon shield. And the results are almost identical across the speeds. I mean, the wake shapes are pretty much the same and they just get a little bit smaller as the speed increases. And effectively, there's a huge wake behind the passenger on the back and a small wake from the rear tire. And in the top left figure, let me zoom in here because it's pretty funny. Uh, you can see the coughing in action coming out of the driver, that little red spike coming up. And the authors say that at higher speeds, so 10, five minutes per second and 15 minutes per second, the cough isn't visible effectively because the oncoming flow is whisking the cough away very quickly. And without the barrier, there definitely seems to be somewhat fast moving flow between the driver's head and the rider. So you can see here, flow in here, which is moving pretty fast. So I think there is a good chance that the cough will be hitting the passenger in the face, but we'll need to see that later on if in fact that does happen. Now, with the big spoon barrier, as shown in figure five on the right here, we see again, there's a huge wake and even bigger really because um, this spoon barrier had makes a big wake behind the passenger and the rear tire also has a big wake. And looking between the driver and the passenger, it's hard to believe that any cough from the driver could make it to the passenger's face. So let me zoom in a bit more again here, here and here and here. I mean, you would really have to jump over the barrier, stop in midair, make a downwards turn and hit the passenger in the face. So from these general velocity fields, it seems like this barrier would work very well. And in figure seven, uh, we see where the different particles flow to. And this is pretty cool too. I'll zoom out a little bit more so we can see them all. Okay, so the blue particles are the tiny one micron particles. The green particles are for the 10 micron particles and the red particles are for the 50 micron particles. And in the left column, again, we see the bike without the spoon, the spoon shield and uh, a velocity of one meter per second, five minutes per second and 15 minutes per second going down. First of all, regardless of the velocity, the passenger is getting hit with some of the cough and particles. And interestingly, the velocity really changes just how which particles are hitting the passenger. So at one meter per second, so the top one here, it's really the 50 micron particles, the red particles that are going into the passenger's face. But at five minutes per second here and 50 minutes per second here, you now have more the one micron and 10 mic micron particles. So the smaller ones hitting the passenger in the face while the 50 micron particles skip over the top. So what is going on here? I think what is happening is that at one meter per second, the oncoming flow isn't enough to manipulate the cough much. So the larger particles are coughed and then just fall out of the air over the passenger. They have too much inertia so they, the flow just can't really whisk them away as easily. So here, some of the 50 micron particles make it to the passenger's face because they just fall out of the air while the smaller ones can still uh, follow the path of the flow and get whisked away without hitting the passenger. Now at higher speeds, the flow is now pretty much controlling where all the particles go and they take hold of the 50 micron particles and push them away while the smaller particles are pushed into the gap between the driver and the passenger, forcing them into the passenger's face and down the front of the passenger's shirt. Whereas the 
50 micron particles, why they skip over now? I don't know exactly. Perhaps the flow directing the particles um, is weakly swirling, so the smaller particles can be whisked away down into the um, crevice between the driver and the passenger, while the larger particles will just fall out and they, they, they can't really follow the flow because they have too much inertia. Either way, we can clearly see here, well, the passenger can't see here because they have the cough in the way and the mucus, but we can see that if you're a passenger, you're getting the driver's cough in your face. And if you scooch up to, and if scooching up to a, a stranger on a motorbike wasn't enough for me to not do that, um, this certainly is. Now in the right column, the spoons barrier is here and we can see the effects of it. So regardless of the speed, the particles just zip over the top and down the front of the shield onto the driver's back as well. So the shield is working really well. And again, we see that depending on the speed, the different sized particles get affected by the flow very differently. So with the 50 micron particles, they fall down mostly at, again, low speeds and the smaller particles uh, follow, fall, like, fall down at higher speeds. And on in vice versa situations, the other particles uh, fly over. Now in table three, they have a really cool breakdown of where the particles are deposited. Now, while this breakdown is really cool, I think it isn't that accurate though. So for example, without the shield, so around here, we see the numbers indicating that almost no particles are being deposited on the passenger if you travel at five meters per second or slower. So all these ones here. Um, but in figure seven, we can clearly see so many particles around this region. And I think that's because um, this is Urans and that the values in table three show almost no depositing, whereas here we see they probably should. And there is swelling flow here. And if you have all these particles in this region, then they're just going to get swelled around and land on everything. So, okay, some might land on the driver's back, as this table suggests. But there are definitely going to be some that land on the passenger's face and body. So I think the values given here in table three aren't that accurate. And if you did a more accurate simulation, maybe a DES one or something, these values would change a lot and become much more homogenized. I find it hard to believe that if you have all these particles literally right next to the passenger's face and body, and none of them will land on them. It doesn't make sense to me. Just these numbers and what I'm seeing here in the flow viz don't seem to gel together with my and pass my reality check. But then again, maybe my reality is tenuous. I don't know. Anyway, now interestingly in table three, with a spoon shield at apparently one meter per second, there are still some large particles making their way over the barrier and onto the passenger, this table says. I don't think that is a big problem though, because uh, the barrier can always just be made larger. The main thing is that we see the barrier is definitely working here. We can see it cutting down a lot. And the table shows that at 50 meters per second, the larger particles are sandwiched between the driver's back and the shield. So they go onto the, the driver a lot more. Now in figure eight, they show the age of the particles uh, during the flow. And for some cases, like the middle left one here, if I zoom in, the particles are hanging around for up to three seconds, literally between the driver's back of the neck and the passenger's face. So they make their way there and just hang around. And according to table three, apparently without depositing on the passenger's face. Now in figure nine, we see the amount of particles entering the region in front of the passenger's face. And with the shield, there are none. So you see this, these lines here, they're zero. But without the shield, there are like up to 8,000 particles per cubic meter, which I think is quite a lot, it's quite dense. So overall, sorry, overall, I think we can conclude that without the shield, you're going to cover, get a lot of that cough on you as a passenger. Um, but with a big spoon shield, you can cut that down possibly to nothing if the shield is big enough. And with that, we end this podcast. So if you liked it, hit the like button. And if you want to see more like this, hit the subscribe or follow button, whichever platform you're on. And if you want to learn OpenVolume, check out the link below. And if you're doing experiments, did you know that you probably have a 2 to 4% error in your data and you don't even know about it? In that Mr. Hawk link below, we go through the math of it and how to fix it. And with that, we'll see you in the next one. Peace out, amigos.